Screen shared real quick. Okay. Hear you, Hello, Macy. Hold on just a second, gals. Is that it? I'll try and say something. Uh, hi, guys. Hope you can hear me. Ella? Yeah, can you hear me? Hello? Now we hear you. Okay. Okay, that's good. Sorry about that. Go oh, no. All good. All right, and Macy's going to kick things off today. All right, so for student council, some things we've been working on are, um, as of right now, we're working on a fundraiser where we're selling these masks that we had like the little bee put on from Paramount and we're going to sell those to the student body as well as the staff. And then another thing would be star awards, which is just like a thing to recognize those like students of the senior class that have like done something like we do like categories, like most likely to be in the new next like Crest commercial or like um, next SoundCloud. So somebody that like sings. And then another thing is that um, the tables for the courtyard that have been made by the woodshop class, and now we are having them painted by our art students. Um, at the school, we, as of today, we headed into the fourth quarter. Um, AP exams are going to be starting up in May for all of those kids that are taking the advanced placement classes. And then spring sports have been playing their matches and been getting COVID tested on Sundays. Um, June 6th is the graduation days for our senior as of right now. So that's something to look forward to. And then last week, the juniors took the SAT. So that was successful and everybody else took the PSAT. And then starting tomorrow, we'll have the M step for those um, students as well. Um, so about senior stuff that's happening, the senior's last day is coming up for May 20th, our graduation rehearsal, senior breakfast, prom, and senior walk are all going to be on June 3rd, um, and we are in the process of planning prom, um, and then our graduation is June 6th, and something that happened recently is senior parents ordered signs for all of the seniors that are um, out by the driveway of the school and they ordered gift bags for us and the cup pictured here was included in the gift bags. And then we'd also like to talk to you guys about cords. Um, I know Macy spoke about cords for graduation at the last meeting but um, Mr. Stevens met with some staff about um, which cords will be permitted for graduation. And they decided that um, they would like any academic cords such as Spanish National Honor Society, Student Council, Link Crew, Yearbook, Band, Honors Cords, STEM Cords, and National Honor Society cords to be allowed at graduation. So we hope that you guys can consider that and hopefully come to a decision. And that is all that we have for you guys today. 
any questions about our progress? Thank you, ladies. Very well done, as always. We appreciate the information and um, we'll, we'll stick to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is our superintendent's report. Oh, thank you. Good evening. First, I'd like to take the moment to thank the public for 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 the Thank you. Any discussion? 
Can we have a roll call vote? Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes, yes. Diane Salter, yes. Beverly Smith Collada, yes. Hilary Sapaski, yes. Beth Silky, yes. Lisa Cavalier, yes. Well, thank you. Our next item is information and discussion items. Um, first, as far as a, a Board of Education report um, from our I'll just provide a little insight that one of the reasons we decided um, initially we were going to possibly incorporate the bond discussion in tonight's meeting we determined that that would be um, a lengthy meeting because we really want to jump in uh, designated time for that. And now we can move on to the finance report. Uh, good evening. Hi. Um, the first thing on the agenda is to uh, discuss our bond uh, refunding. As you know, you did approve a resolution to refund the school bond loan fund. We had some information a couple weeks ago that was to our benefit to explore not only refunding the uh, school bond loan fund, but to refund a portion of the um, 2016 refunder, which was originally the 2006 bond. By doing this, we can increase our bonding capacity a little over 5 million, which is a without, still with a no, no increase, so that's good news. Um, there's really no downside to doing this. It's, um, we're, we're just combining to, now our bond issue is going to be not to exceed about 53 million. We think it'll be a little bit less than that, but that the resolution states at 53 and 53.5 million. Um, we will have the same timeline as we had prior. And um, so basically it's, um, there's just, there's, there's no downside. This is a good thing for us. Are there any questions on that? I just have a question. It seems like we vote on this. Is it once a year? How or is it just as things happen? Or can we do this four or five times a year? I mean, uh, well, we've done a few of them. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> that's a fair question. Yeah, it is. yeah. We um, had the well a few years ago. We were we had the ability to do this like every nine years. So we had the two, or 1996 bond here that was refunded in 2008, and then we did it in 2018. So there was a cycle. We're now refunding the refundings. <laughs> so that's where we're at. Um, this particular one with the 2016 refunding, the rules changed, I think, in, like, 2017. Um, why we didn't discuss it or RJ didn't bring it up with us when we originally talked about refunding the school bond loan fund, um, he just um, he just didn't. <laughs> so when he realized that these bonds were callable and a portion of them, again, the rules had changed, um, we immediately jumped on the opportunity to discuss this with the board. And so we, we have done a lot of them. Primarily the reason is interest rates have gone down. So they're lower this year than they were last year and the year before. And so every time we've done a refunder, we saved money. Um, with this one, we're looking at a savings of about, over the last several years, over $10 million to the taxpayers. Uh -huh. So that's substantial. Yeah, that's all of the refunding combined. This particular one, um, just by adding the 2016, um, Refunding, we're um, saving about two million, two point two million. So this is all just in the interest of saving, saving um, taxpayer money. So how do we get that message out there? Because that's a big one, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm sure we'll discuss it in our community forums. But yeah, yeah, yeah I think we can get that message out there. We can write a press release. Um, if there's a variety of avenues we could take with that. Um, the original refunding that was approved with the resolution before was to save around eight hundred thousand to one million dollars. So combining this with the mm -hmm. advanced refunding, now we're at two point two million dollars. So market conditions are favorable for Brandon to do this, and it's something that we should let the taxpayers know. Mm -hmm. I think yes, I I agree one hundred percent. It is 
exactly a, a on point question because I think historically, um, preceding my time on the board, um, but particularly during my time, I think the, the board, um, along with Jan's fantastic help in, in identifying opportunities, um, has taken advantage of these opportunities. It's proactive approach to you know the getting a, a decrease and taking a, a veiling school of that opportunity in the community. So I think that it's this moment in time that we're you know taking on this resolution and considering it. But I also think there's value in visiting um, the school's efforts overall to pay attention and that we we care proactively. We we care what this you know financing arm of our school, the most one of the most important important features looks like. So I I think we need to focus on some next steps in response to Ken's question. Yeah, happy to help with any ideas or like work, let me know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That may be part of the S committee, who knows? I'm mm -hmm. sure it will be. Yeah, yeah I'm sure, yeah. but I think um, I agree 100%. Um, a lot of the S committee work is I understand the you know project management timeline that we'll most likely be tracking. Perhaps we want to get the message out a little bit earlier oh, than when the activity oh, there might might be. A great idea. I love it. I'm it all ties to together, but it really is about augmenting that yes committee with Correct. some of the great things that you've been on top of for I mean your entire Ever. time. Forever. Here. Yeah. So and and I genuinely say that. So right. I mean, it's part of the big picture. So and this is not news to sit on. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not news right. to sit on and wait. It's right. shout it out right now. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Agreed. Very good. Um, Does every, anybody have any questions before we move on to um, the next topic under Jan's report? Does anybody have anything you'd like to discuss on that line item? Just to make sure we're. No, ma'am. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item that I'd like to discuss tonight um, are ESSER funds. I think you're all aware of. It's in the news. We have three different series of ESSER funds. So I wanted to kind of put it together and give you an overview I'll add some details on ESSER funds, what it means to us um, from the financial perspective, which it is all financial. But um, so this. Look here. There it is. Okay. So. ESSER 1, we received $190,356. That was approved um, last spring. That money was used for technology purchases, hotspots, everything technology related. Um, we've spent all that money. ESSER 2 was passed, I believe, in December. Um, and that funding, primarily, we're planning to use it for um, budget shortfalls, which encompasses a lot of things. Um, our balances. 862441. We have not spent any of that money. We're in the process of applying uh, to get approval to spend some of that money, but to date we have not. ESSER 3 is the newest one, passed a few weeks ago, and that's the biggest one. Um, our allocation is a million nine, one million nine thirty six nine twenty, and um, again we're primarily looking to use that for the next two or three years to cover budget shortfalls. A um, one thing of note with the ESSER 3 is that 20% of that allocation, or 387384 must be used for uh, learning loss through evidence-based interventions such as summer learning, summer enrichment, extended day after school, or extended school year programs. Uh, again, we have not even applied for that money. So our total ESSER funding funding from the government, $2,989,000, just uh, shy of $3 million. So these next few screens, I, I found these and I thought they were really kind of to put this whole ESSER in context, um, which of the following is not an allowable use of ESSER funds. We're allowed to enlarge a gym, reinstate a pay raise, pay the fees for uh, vendors, pay for staff positions that would otherwise be cut due to enrollment declines, replenish the reserve funds. So the government, the federal government does not want us to use this money and just kind of build up our, our savings, so to speak. They want it to be used proactively. Um, and we can also use it to supply COVID tests. Oh, 
Oops, did I miss one? Oh. Okay, this one's a big one. Um, for those of us that were in school finance after the ARA or during the ARA time, we know what happened. We got this ARA money that was back in 2009, 2010, and then the money ran out and we took a $470 per pupil pay cut. So we're trying to avoid what um, is referred to as a funding cliff. So the federal dollars enables districts to maintain a cost structure, but it's, this money is going to run out. Um, funding cliffs are typical when federal relief stops, and we saw that again during ARA. And then in the right there, this is kind of what we're, this, Carl and I discussed this, we want to pace ourselves and plan ahead for when federal money. So we wanna plan the next three or four years. We know this money most likely is not going to continue. It's just kind of putting it in perspective. So this is a what they call the tricky balance. Do we spend now to address learning loss, which we do need to do some of that, versus case spending to avert a fiscal cliff, which is what we saw years ago. And then this is you know just a suggestion: how much, what percentage do we want to spend next year, the year after, and the year after that? And we are working on all of these questions. Beware of added recurring costs. This, again, is a big one. Um, instead of recurring expenses, which would be things like um, new hires, uh, base pay raises, uh, increased benefits, permanent calendar changes, changes to class sizes. Consider one-time expenses like stipends, contractors, one-time hazard pay, facility upgrades, um, summer school temporarily and the weeks of school. So the, the goal would be to bring things in that when the funding leaves, they may not be able to afford. And then um, just general ESSER spending considerations that these are all separate awards. We have to track them separate. They're being treated much like Title I. So the restricted funds, we have to apply for them, how we're gonna spend them. And then once we spend them, I'll turn in for reimbursement to get, to get the money back. Um, they have to be what might be necessary and reasonable in one circumstance might not be in another. So there's, it, it, they're being treated much like Title I, which um, we're very familiar with. They can be spent on the same activities. Um, use of funds are very broad under all of the ESSER programs. Again, that's really important. So we're not tied in to having to spend it on one area. And in a minute, I'll show you some, some different areas. So we do have a lot of um, leeway on with the allowable use, but for our budget, we're gonna have to probably go one direction a little bit more. Um, so let's talk about allowable uses. We can pay for additional staff um, to address recruitment retention challenges. We can pay for transportation for, um, if, we, if we chose to, again, these are all options to increase social distancing. We can pay for um, instructional curriculum materials with this money, um, evidence-based reading curriculum to address uh, learning loss. We can pay for MTSS materials. Again, academic recovery to address learning loss. That would be like the summer programs, extended uh, day uh, after school, before school programs. We can pay for school facilities and infrastructure costs. Uh, we've done some, we purchased our PPE, but we could, if there was some great HVAC system upgrade, um, we would be allowed to do that with this money. Um, we can, and this is where it gets real general. Providing principals and other school leaders with the resources necessary to address the needs of their individual schools. Well, that's a really subjective category there. So we're kind of, when Carly and I were working on this last week, um, we had to apply for some of this money. We kind of put some things in that category. It made sense. Uh, mental health warning systems and counseling for students and staff. I think we all know that that's a big, um, a big talking point is the, the mental health. Purchasing educational technology. And then again, addressing learning loss among students, including low-income students, um, those are at-risk students. Uh, purchasing our supplies to clean the facilities. We used, um, we used some state money this year, that additional state money to do that. Repairs and improvements. Um, and then this last one is really, truly 
are kept off. Other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation of and continuity of services in local educational agencies. So that one is catch all. Budgetary shortfalls, I, I put this in here because um, we'll be talking more about that in the next month and in June when the budget is presented to you. We're going to plug our short, we're going to use some of this money to plug, um, to balance our budget. And the education department says that ESSER funds may be used to bridge budget shortfalls if the deficit is related to the coronavirus and the ESSER funds are needed for education related expenses. So it just talks about, um, you know, we're basically, basically we can use this to plug our, um, balance our budget. And then this last one I thought was good. Um, I don't know that they had this in ARA. This is just maintenance of effort is saying that the state cannot reduce <laughs> our funding. They have to fund us at the levels like for um, fiscal year 22 next year. States must, and this is the middle one, states must spend the same proportion of their state budgets on education as they did on average in 17, 18, 19. So this is saying the state can't, you know, oh, well, the district's got money from the federal government, so we're going to, you know, cut them or whatever, which is good. Hopefully this will continue past um, the years um, when this funding runs out. We just, we don't want another funding cliff where we're in three years, um, states run out of money. So that's kind of an overview of ESSER. Um, questions? I have a couple. Yeah. Um, within the each... Uh, tranche of funds. There's no required allocation percentage within that based on the, pur the purposes, right? You could throw all of the money at one category. You don't have, we're not confined that way. Correct. Okay. Correct. And SR3 expires, so we have to spend like September of 24, SR2 is September of 23. So we probably will go ahead and spend SR2 first. Right. And then, then SR3. But um, we're still working on the budget. Like I said, we'll talk more next month and, and for sure in June. Um, and coming up with what our number will be. How much of the ESSER money are we going to need for next year? Right in, and in the fall. And yeah. go from there. And in ESSER 3, there's a certain percentage we are required to use for learning loss. Learning loss at 20 years. Yeah, right. uh, almost 400,000. Okay. Right. 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 Thank you. Yeah, so. other, other than that, I should yeah. qualify. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, and then my other question was, um, I had heard timing by which deadlines, you know, each yep. one, two, and three had to be spent by. So you just answered that. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, and we are currently, we just applied for, um, well, this week we'll be applying for 43%. The governor did release 43% of SR2. The rest of it's coming. So we're working on that, keeping the categories real general. You know, we don't mm -hmm. box ourselves in. And um, and then we're also applying for the 23B, but Carly's going to talk about that as well for summer school. So that's ESSER. We're going to be you're going to be hearing more about that. <laughs> well, thank you for putting the thought into you know the cliff avoiding. <laughs> well, that's, that's a big one. one. Yeah, that's the big one. I yeah. think we want to glide path downward, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. No cliffs. Yeah, yeah. we don't want it. Um, and then my last topic tonight is um, our DM Burr contract. I think um, much of everyone knows the new board members. The district voted, I believe, in 2011-12, that's right before I got here, to uh, contract with DM Burr. So we've had them for now 10, 12 years. Um, every two years, we do a contract addendum. So the current contract addendum, um, I believe it was in the board packet. It would be um, actually it's going to be a decrease in the current contract. This year we did we added five extra custodians. Through lots of discussions, it was decided that the touch point cleaning can be done in other ways, and the, the money we were paying for the five custodians um, was one of the things that we decided and we were recommending that we we don't keep all five of them. So. We're going to give the, um, this current contract gives the current custodians a raise, which they haven't had in two years. They don't get one every year. Makes us comparable to surrounding districts. We looked at Holly and Davison and, you know, Lake Orion. So our wages are comparable or maybe even still slightly lower. Um, we're going to do that. And then we will 
still see a budget savings with this contract of 133916 And that is mainly because we're reducing the number of custodians we have. And that was through a lot of input uh, really throughout. Um, we know so much more about COVID and kids now, and it really is airborne. Mm -hmm. Touching. Mm -hmm. Touch point. Yeah, not that that wasn't valuable, but of course. Um, it did cost us cost us quite a bit. So that's the Danver it is a two-year extension. Um, any, any questions on that Danver contract? If we found the need to increase the personnel again, I'm assuming the contract has that ability with their yeah, we would do we would do an addendum and, done. Um, and then add like we did last summer when right. the board chose to add the five custodians. I think we did that last July. Right. So it would be so nothing has changed. Our capability yeah. is retained. We would come to the board and get a board action to add that addendum for X cost, whatever it was, and then uh, Denver would retire those for us. Does anybody have any other questions regarding that line item? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, now we are moving on to HC, which is our education report with Carly Stone. All right. So in a uh, typical fashion, I'm going to talk about what we've, been, what we've accomplished, uh, what we're working on, and what we're looking forward to. Um, luckily, uh, Macy and Ella shared some of this for us earlier, which I very much so appreciate. But last month was March. We had a ton of really fun March um, is reading month celebrations. We had the drive through book fair that Connie Babb put together at the iTech Center. And then my boys and I drove through there and picked out some great stuff. And, Clifford was there and all. Um, <laughs> some really great celebrations from the schools um, with activities for students to do at home as well. Uh, we had a district-wide professional learning day at the end of March. That was really exciting. It was a day in which teachers could choose their path of professional learning. We had a few mandatory items because of the required state testing that we had to put into place. Um, but then they also had a chance to pick from the menu of choices that best fit their individual needs as growing as professionals. So really excited about that and staff really, um, the feedback from that was very positive. Uh, we launched our branding, Brandon Teaching and Learning Committee, uh, BTLC. I've spoken previously about the Curriculum Council and having a chance to relaunch that. So we brandonized it a little bit and did BTLC and not BLT. I know some people wonder about that. Um, so that was really a lot of fun. So we used some time on professional learning data to ensure that we could maximize the amount of people that wanted to be there. It would be available to participate. And so uh, we had just about 30 staff members participate in that meeting. They had a chance to share um, where, where they believe our areas of strength are in curriculum and instruction as a district, areas of opportunity for us. And then also talking about our professional development plan for um, next year as well. So that was a lot of fun. I've already been in touch with a few of them uh, for different reasons. In fact, I've got a meeting with uh, our literacy team uh, tomorrow morning. So pretty excited about that. It was a great meeting. I'm very thankful for the staff that participated. And again, Macy and Ella kind of took this one for us. But uh, for us, launching MSTEP and SAT and PSAT this week this year, that was like big stuff. So you talk about kudos to a lot of folks. Um, this is a great place to add some kudos. Um, I know that our staff at the high school just worked tirelessly. Diane Zidane and her crew uh, with all the accommodations and such. It's been, it's a, it's a mountain every year. Um, and this year it was just uh, tremendous and, and we, we got to the top of it. So Carly, was it helpful to have it the second week after spring was. break? Was it that was really a, a relief? Yeah. So first or? Yes, so I know um, it was just nice for folks to get a chance to connect the week prior. It's very high anxiety. You guys know there's a lot that goes into it. There's really thick manuals and procedures and protocols we've been really thoughtful to. And to have it gives a chance to kind of catch our breath a little bit when kids came back from break. Right? Right. And so we're actually quite thankful as to how that felt, particularly this year. Right. Thank you. Good. Okay. Sorry for the yeah, interruption. No, no problem. And so, yeah, fifth and eighth graders have taken um, stop. Um, our eighth graders are done. 
Our fifth graders are in the midst of it right now. They're in a window. They have a, actually they've extended the window now till uh, midnight um, in response to all those folks that are remote learners. But we are chugging away. We are planning to be done um, ahead of time uh, in that case. So yeah, and the ladies also said earlier that the end of the third quarter was last week. It's just amazing to me that this year is just flying. And so the report cards are going home for most uh, by the 23rd, but I believe the high school has extended a few more days because of the number of students in quarantine and such to try to get those captured as best we can. So what are we working on? We're working on our planning for next year. And um, so as you already know, we've indicated in previous uh, meetings that we will be reverting back to our 1920 schedule in terms of our six hour day at the secondary and our start and end times. Um, I know uh, in that meeting, Carl had shared some unknowns that we were still curious about regarding social distancing, mask wearing, et cetera. Um, at this point today on April 19th, um, we think it's fair to say that we are anticipating the mask mandate to continue into the coming school year. So we want to put that out there now for families. And uh, since we met last, the CDC changed their guidance for distancing in buildings. Right now, you guys know we are uh, we follow the six foot spacing, um, and we are looking to transition to the recommended three foot because right now we are exceeding that expectation with our six feet. So, um, come the fall, we are anticipating the three foot spacing and mask wearing. And we know those are two really important factors to families, so we wanted to get that information out as soon as we could. So the reason we share that is because we need to ask our families what their platform selection is going to be for next school year in order to help us really cement our plans as best we can uh, for the fall. So what that timeline looks like um, is that tomorrow we have a communication ready to go out to our families indicating that um, we would like them to let us know if they would like either the brand and learn from home experience or to participate in our summit virtual academy for the 21-22 school year. The deadline for that would be May 14th, um, that is a Friday. Um, and by having that on May 14th, that still gives us a month or so with our own staff, our teaching staff here um, that can help us with our planning for the coming school year. And then it also gives us uh, quite a bit of time as administrators um, to work on scheduling and all of, the, all of the logistics that come along with that. Um, so to help families in that decision making, uh, we did want to provide a community forum, a parent forum, where we'll not just talk about the brain and learn from home experience for the coming school year, but we'll also just talk about the learning experience for the coming school year. Uh, we know we have families that are anxious to come back in person, but there are some sticking points such as mask wearing or distancing, etc. We want to give them a chance to question and answer uh, with not just ourselves, but our building administrators um, as well. And uh, Mr. Dave White will also have some information about Learn From Home for next year um, and what uh, what we anticipate that looking like as well. So those dates, that's a Tuesday, April 27. Um, we will have an elementary meeting first and we will have a, second, a secondary one at 630. And those meetings will be reported via Zoom. So if any family member is not able to participate on those days, we will put those recordings up on our website those will be available to them all the way up until uh, May 14th. And of course, all of us are happy to answer any questions for any, any families between them as well. Yes, is sir. that all virtual forum though anyway? I mean, it's virtual or is there gonna be in person? It would be, in, it would be virtual. It would be all virtual all recorded. Yes. So like you said, the parents can catch up later if they're yes. unable to attend. Okay, perfect, thank yeah. you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. So, and just know if a family doesn't respond to the survey, because we know we have many families here in the district, they would be defaulted then to in-person um, instruction then for the fall. So if you are you know, wanting, really seeking the Learn From Home Experience or our Summer Virtual Academy, it's really, really important that we capture that information by uh, May 14th. So we really appreciate that for our own planning purposes on our end. Any questions on that before? I yeah. So I wasn't being disrespectful and looking at my phone for text messages. I was looking at the calendar. That's in three weeks. Yes. As a parent, I don't feel comfortable with that amount of time frame. Our school year's not even over with. And I feel that I, I believe, at least in my house and my parents, like, you know, you have your end of June. I know June is way too, way too late, but 
kind of the end of May is what I just kind of thought in the back of my head right now. You have Memorial Day. We come back. We come back. Memorial Day is like the last like hurrah, and then you're basically you're done. Like we just we go through the motions for like those few days in June, right? Like we're finishing things up, we're gearing up, we're doing graduation, we're kind of commencing these school years over with. So I feel that as a parent, um, three weeks to me, twenty one days. Uh, as a parent of two, I couldn't imagine if I had a parent of three or four or five or whatever, whatever people's situations are in, where we're giving them enough time to make a huge decision just because in the past we have had parents that wanted to get in and they didn't have, they didn't have enough time to decide that type of thing. So I would like us to visit the thought process of pushing that back a couple weeks to around the end of May just because it gives everyone a good enough time to talk to their spouses or guardians or whoever it is that's taking care of our children in the district to truly sit down with their kids and talk about it, sit down with, if there's anybody like in Diane's team that needs to talk about with special needs, mental health, the whole gamut, and really give more than three weeks. Because I will tell you as a parent, I, I would not be able to make a decision for you in three weeks with my two. Um, so that's just my personal opinion, but. I just wanted to at least articulate that. So. Well, no, we well, welcome that. that. Thank you very much. I, I will tell you, we've been wrestling with the timeline yeah. on our end. Um, we've had quite a few conversations about it here. And um, you know, I think it's definitely open. We can have more, more dialogue. Just know that our driving factors, we're just trying to be cognizant mm -hmm. of um, being fair to um, our staff. Um, right. not just our teachers and their possible placements for the coming school year and ensuring that we had the right placements and the right people in the right in the right places, um, but also um, what it takes to make it happen. Our high school counselors, our administrative staff, um, and, and those are everything you brought up on some very fair points, and we, we definitely talked about those, and we appreciate you bringing them up, and we're happy to continue to have the conversation, um, have the conversation about that. So how, um, so once a parent commits one way or another, we're locked in, like this year I know that, you know, everybody made a decision sure. and then it was based on if, you know, they let people decide something different after first primary, I don't remember yeah. the whole yeah. timeline, yeah. first whatever, semester, primary, and then, and then they were kind of locked in unless someone else sure. backed out. So what does that look like? Yeah, great. These are all conversations we're having right now. So um, one, uh, in our conversation, we talked about semester being a key opportunity for families to make a change should they want to do so um, next school year. So obviously, our, our, our struggle too, Melissa, is that we know that other districts around us have already had their families make commitments. And Oxford had to make theirs, I think, several weeks ago. We're trying to be thoughtful and give our families more time and play it out a little bit longer while still giving us some grace to kind of make all the magic happen behind the scenes. Um, we do recognize that things very well could change over the summer. Um, we are not naive to that. We've lived, <laughs> we've lived that life. And should circumstances change for a family, should something happen in which um, it really changes um, their particular choice, we will always be open and thoughtful to that. Um, but it is really important for us in our own planning purposes as a whole, trying to get the collective majority, trying to understand where that falls. Um, it's really beneficial to us to ensure that we're ready to go solid in the fall for when students return. Sure. So, but we are looking at a window of semester transition should a family want to make a change uh, next week. That's what's currently being discussed. Is that even feasible with staffing? I mean, is it something that is realistically feasible to be able to do. And that's what we're discussing. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. We, we, think, we think so uh, with, with the, the spacing, but it really is going to be dependent on the, the amount of the students that we have in the virtual program. Right. So at, to answer that question today, um, we're thinking about it. We're thinking about that question. But in reality, we, we really have to have a measurement of how many kids we have in some and, and bring to learn from home. And the feasibility of that depends on that number. That's a great question, though. And I'm assuming it's going to be the same at that uh, point, too. So if students decide to change at semester, they'll be going to go in person, let's say, from Brandon Learn from Home. They'll be going back to a school with a different teacher and a different class in like this year. That's right. 
That's how we currently see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And one last thought, this kind of harkens back to a prior topic, I apologize, but the, the numbers, right? It's all about the numbers and yes. a lot of space. So yes. do we have a, a feel for what our spacing does look like at a three foot range if we dependent on the number that we may anticipate being in, continuing on or being in for the first time next year face to face. Do we have a feel uh, for that? Yeah, we do. We have a sense that it, with three feet spacing in general, we can we can go with uh, average class size, which is okay. which is good to know across the board. Now, if those class sizes went up to a level that we couldn't do that, then that could be problematic for us. Sure. Um, if we're getting uh, students in maybe a semester time that want to transfer from virtual to in-person, but generally, we think we can make it work for an average class size. Okay. Yes. All right. And, 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 that, and that might go into about class sizes in general and yeah. try to right. balance our scheduling matrix the best we can mm -hmm. uh, going in the first semester in the fall and be mindful of uh, our staffing to, to accommodate uh, class sizes that may not be over, over the, the mid range. So right. all those elements we got to put together into something that makes sense right now. So. For sure, for sure. It's just a, an often discussed topic as, as we all know um, this year. And therefore we just want to go in with, with the authentic reality as to what it is, you know, as best one can. Absolutely. Um, because it's, it's, it's so do we, right? It's, of um, course, everybody. Yeah. You know, trying to be thoughtful yep. to that timeline again. And um, also been very fortunate that right now people can collect if they want to go virtually. We've had the link live, we've had students already select to be either learn from, learn from home or Summit Virtual already. Mr. Wyatt's been very proactive mm -hmm. um, and in his weekly newsletter that has been going out for a few weeks now. Um, so we've already begun to capture some names of some students that want to be learn from home or participate in Summit. So we're going to continue that conversation and have that open. Um, and we'll, you know, we can talk about the deadline um, of, of May 14th, but that's the initial plan. Right. And you know, at the risk of ever suggesting um, everybody's not doing the absolute best they can and, and have, have a great plan in place, I would never, never suggest otherwise. However, toward Melissa's point, I, I think one of the pieces, almost regardless of when the time, the deadline is, but particularly if it stays where it is, is while there's the forum, you know, I'm sure there's conversations going on about what else can be done to ensure that families have full on exchanges, communications, access, um, um, issue uh, spotter, you know, notices that go out, things that people won't even know to know, you know, um, that, sort of, that sort of communication and um, publicity on it, for lack of a better word, so that it, that deadline is, um, the, the time during, before that deadline is that much more lively with engagement so people have what they need at the end of the day if we really need to respect that deadline. Um, that's just one way of not remedying the deadline, but it's sure. a way of ensuring it's very full yeah. and everybody feels they have access and information. That's really so, fair. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so uh, just to move back to testing again, I'm sorry, but that, that is our life in the spring. Um, <laughs> we will, uh, starting uh, May 3rd, we will be um, opening the window for our third graders, our fourth graders, our sixth graders, and our seventh graders. Oh, and then goodness. in district, we do our end of year assessments in the WEA, and those will open up the first week of May as well. So um, we will be testing for the big care home stretch. So what are we looking forward to? Jan mentioned this earlier, um, you know, recognizing there are additional funding opportunities out there um, with the ASTER funds and also 23B. Uh, we've been thoughtful of the district in what ways can we potentially access those funds to support our students. So one program we're really excited to launch is uh, the Kids Read Now program. And I know it was mentioned at a previous board meeting while I was recovering from my 
second COVID shot. Um, <laughs> but uh, essentially, it is a program. We know that we've heard about the summer slide. We've heard about summer reading and, and promoting students' summer reading. This is a research-based program um, that has uh, multiple studies done in which our students here in Brandon, each student will receive in the mail eight books at not only their reading level, but their interest level. Mailed wow. to their homes once a week um, throughout the entire summer. And um, students will receive a catalog, much like this one. In fact, it could be this one. And it is um, color coded with grade levels and topics where they, along with their teacher, will select the books that they receive over the summer. So they're not just going to get any random book. Wow. They're going to get books. There's nonfiction, fiction, their favorite characters, That's some awesome. new characters. There's um, some really fantastic books of all different walks of life in here that students can select. Um, what will happen is um, these books will be selected alongside the teacher. The student and the teacher will do it together. Families will then get this information. This is the really cool part. There is an app for families to participate. This nonprofit company reaches out to the family weekly, reminding them of the new book coming, tells them, you know, did you read your new book? What was it? You know, kind of just promoting it so there's that frequent communication happening from the company. Each book, and I apologize, I left it in my office, comes with a sticker on the inside that has prompt questions a parent can ask the student as they're reading the book. So they're often text to self, um, you know, different connections, text to text, text to real life. Um, and so they can engage in a dialogue about the book the student is reading. There's, some compre there's a comprehension question there as well. And so by promoting this, we feel it, this really complements our early literacy program for our students in grades K-2, so that they can be, these would be um, exiting K-2 students right now, so they will be successful and help them when they get into third grade, because we know we have the read by grade three uh, requirement. Right. So very excited. In addition to all of those things, our teachers are amazing. They're already coming up with ideas that they can stay engaged with their students over the summer so they can share what books the kids are reading with each other, whether it be on Zoom or whatever it may be. So we anticipate like a, a Facebook feed um, of students sharing the books that they're reading and really having it be a really great a lot of community energy over our students reading over the summer. So super excited about that. All students exiting K-2. Very cool. Um, so Camp Learn, we're launching. This is a targeted camp opportunity for our students that um, we are, are noticing through our data points that um, need some additional support. So this is a program that's going to be running in August um, with our Brandon teachers and our Brandon, Brandon literacy coaches. Um, and this year, uh, we're adding mathematics to it as well. Traditionally, it's only been based uh, with literacy, and we are including mathematics. We've expanded the day a little bit, so it's going to be from 9 to 1, so we have more time to make sure we can fit in some math and some fun at the same time. Um, luckily, we can uh, partner up with our uh, Meetup Vita. I always say it the wrong way around. I think I got it. Meet up, meet up, meet up. <laughs> um, so our students will be able to get breakfast and lunch by participating in this program. Um, and uh, so really excited transportation will be provided, all those good things. Yes. Oh, yes. For the kids read now. Yeah. If I understand that, that's done with their current teacher, correct? Or is it that the, the, their current teacher says, because the parents are signing up for this right now, hopefully, or by the end of the school year. And pretty much the interaction is going to be all virtual in the summer. And it's going to be from home. Hopefully parent encouragement, plus if they get the app and the teachers. Yeah. So they, they have eight weeks to read. And then it would be great to go start on August 3rd. And then that would be in person and, and or virtual. Or how is us? The three week program. Thank you for asking that question. I did not include it. So it's in person. Okay, that would be in person. That, 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 that program is in person. The books that the students will get to select, they're actually going to select, fingers crossed, by the end of this week. Oh, perfect. So that they can be ready. They will get their first book before school is out. Awesome. In the mail. And then they will get a book each week thereafter. And then they get a blank book with a bunch of pictures. And the kids get to write a story about the pictures that they see. So I get, they get to incorporate some writing as well. So what's really great is when the parents want to take the kids on that family trip in the car, they will have, mm -hmm. if they wait till week two, there'll be two books minimum yes. to read. Yep. And it'll be something as 
you sit around the campfire or out on the beach or whatever that you could talk about. Yeah. And it'd be great, like I say, for the, get those kids reading. And if the child is going to grandma's house, um, they will get communication oh, from this uh, company here in the mm -hmm. next few weeks verifying their address. So should they be going to grandma's for the summer, they can change the address to make sure the folks go to grandma. Um, so it's really a unique program. So cool. um, many districts around us have utilized it in years past. I'm excited to, to have to add Brandon to the list. Um, I think it's going to be really uh, energizing for our community over the summer. Kids are going to have lots of really fun books they can read on their own. Not all of us parents are literacy, I was a math and science teacher, so um, otherwise a teacher, I didn't teach reading. And, um, and so not all of us have those skills to teach reading, so we'll have access to books um, that the students will be able to work on on their own. So we're super, super excited about that. And, and one more question. Yeah, yeah. Every one of our kindergartens, first and second graders, they can be part of this. There is no cutoff. They're so all getting it. Everybody's mm -hmm. getting it, so mm -hmm. there's no reason to not do yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we opted everybody in. Good. Everybody exiting K2. So okay, Does everybody want to see the expression on my high schooler space is what I suggest we participate in this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take pictures. That's what I was just thinking. Like, so awesome. program. Yeah. We won't have it the same. only goes three, three, but I'm thinking, I mean, it's just really fun. It's, it's just awesome. Amazing. It's oh, incredible. I love it. I'm so excited. excited. I like it. I'm so excited. I'm oh excited. God, it's like perfect. Good stuff. So yeah. some other summer activities we've got going on is the, the Oakland Youth Innovation Camp. We do have a cohort of students from Brandon participating in this nice. class. Good. So we're excited. Good. It will be at Craig Clarkson High School. Um, and actually, that starts actually in May. Um, we are uh, utilizing those 23B funds. We did apply for that for credit recovery purposes. Um, and so we will be running an in-person and virtual credit recovery program this summer for students in grades 9 and 12. We, uh, it is our plan at this time to have both ELA and mathematics available in person as well as online. So should a family uh, want, we're gonna you know, recommend they do those classes in person, mm -hmm. but if they're not able to, for whatever reason, um, the virtual option will be available. We will have a computer lab open here in the district as we have in years past for all other content areas that will be staffed by our brand and staff. Um, the at-risk counselor that was brought on last uh, board meeting will be running this program for us at the high school. So he'll be overseeing students that are participating. It makes sense. He's our at risk counselor. He'll be working with our students that are currently behind in credit. So we're very excited about that. That information will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, everything is getting finalized at this time. So very excited about that. You can anticipate the 4th of July holiday is always funky in there with the timing. Yeah. Um, so it's very likely that we're going to launch that program that the first week after school gets out uh, for three weeks with a week off during the 4th of July break. So, but there's always that virtual option as well for those that not able to participate in person it's half a day in the morning and again students are actually going to house it at Brandon Middle School um, and they'll be able to get access again to free breakfast and free lunch right. for those that participate so trying to be strategic about the resources that we have to best serve our students and then we're not done yet we're not <laughs> done coming up with some summer programs um, because it's just we're constantly evolving with COVID times and trying to make it all work um, so some things you can see that have happened historically through community ed, and I don't want to take Jan's thunder. I know there's the grass program um, that we've done historically for students K-8. Um, that's going to continue. Camp Hawk will be available um, with some use of some vendors and such as well. Um, and I know there'll be summer tutoring available because well through community ed. So we're looking forward to getting all of those pieces finalized. We feel we're a little behind just because of all the COVID stuff and, and trying to figure out what can we run, what can't we run. And everybody feels that same way across the county. Pretty excited to be able to present these items uh, for you this evening, knowing that uh, we know we have more to come and that uh, you can look forward to seeing those in the next few weeks as well. Yeah, we're yeah. working on adding, there'll be um, several camps. So we're just kind of working on that. We'll be signing some um, Bob will do a um, coding camp, which is more popular. Yeah. So. More to come on that. We're working challenge on with this event. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some, yeah. Some, some science and STEM type things. So we're not like this. Yeah. Fingers crossed. We, we applied for 23B funds for those. We'll see if if those are approved. If those being yeah. innovative and um, STEM based. We hope so. Then we wouldn't have to charge. In the past, we've charged 
Lions community had to be charged tuition for those camps. But if we get if we get the uh, 23 B money, we'll be able to offer that um, no cost. That would be great. Amazing. And then lastly, just my last slide is um, kindergarten enrollment is open. Um, we we're looking, we're excited. We keep we keep uh, looking at how many kindergartners we're looking forward to having next year. And just a reminder, all families that um, now is the time to, to get them enrolled. So that's my report for this evening. Fantastic! Everything that you listed your was just packed with one exciting thing to the next. It's, I know there's still so many conversations going on, as you said, and so many things to figure out, but as, as uh, that is the platform, it's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Thank you to you and the team, everybody for the hard work on that, because figuring it out in a, a, a more routine summer is, is a full plate enough, but figuring it out now, that much more difficult. So thank you. Thank you to everybody who's involved with that. Does anybody have any questions of Carly or comments? Um, just real quick on kindergarten enrollment. So I know the open houses are kind of pushed back a little later than normal, right? So will after a parent enrolls, will they get an email for their homeschool saying when that is? Okay. Yes. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's already in preschool, um, they've already enrolled. It's just going to be rolled over to our school. Um, they feel that they get, um, in summer, when they have to get there. I just have one question I thought of. Um, perhaps I'm just not in the, that space anymore, but what do we have going out for enrollment um, branding and, and cultivating all of our younger families? <laughs> yeah, well, we have uh, social media ads going out. Um, so we, we've had some opportunities by uh, email and letter. Uh, we've also um, had a postcard that went out last week. Uh, we have one more specific for uh, kindergarten and preschool going out first week in May. So if you got one postcard in the mail, you're probably going to get another one here in a few weeks talking specifically about kindergarten enrollment. So some marketing, some branding for this. Currently, we're at 157 kindergartners for next year. That includes uh, JK. Uh, we're... But this, this current year, we had 185. So okay. we're about on the mark where we were last year at this time. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Just wanted to touch base. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to circle back real quick. I know in your presentation, you said that you wanted to send an email out. You wanted to send an email out tomorrow. I'm assuming that you guys are going to go back to the drawing board and or is that email going out tomorrow? Or are you going back to the drawing board to figure out that point I, that we brought up? I think we're going to go back to the, the drawing board to talk about it, but we still might get it out by the end of the day. So. I just want to yeah. be on the lookout for my email. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, sure, no worries. Okay, very good. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. All right. Now we're moving on to our action items on our agenda. And the first item that we have is contract approval for the Branded Administrators Association. May I have a motion, please? Move the Brandon Board of Education approve the BAA contract as presented. Support. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes, yes. Diane Salter? Yes. Kimberly Smith Kalaga? Yes. Hilary Stokowski? Yes. Jeff Zoki? Yes. Lisa Cavaluna? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Our next action item is contract approval, central office staff, and maintenance staff. May I have a motion? Move the Brandon Board of Education approve central office staff and maintenance staff contracts as presented. Second. Any discussion? Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please? Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes? Yes. Diane Salter? Yes. Kimberly Smith Kalaga? Yes. Hilary Stokowski? Yes. Jeff Zoki? Yes. Lisa Cavaluna? Yes. Motion passes. The next item is the approval of the DM Burr contract extension. May I have a motion? 
Move the Brandon Board of Education approve the DM Berg contract extension as presented. Support. Any discussion? All right, may I have a roll call? Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes, yes. Diane Salter, yes. Kimberly Smith Kalaga, yes. Hilary Stokowski, yes. Jeff Zilke, yes. Lisa Cavaluna, yes. Motion passes. Next, we have our approval of the extended COVID-19 continuity of learning plan. We have a motion. Move the Brandon Board of Education approve the extended COVID-19 continuity plan as presented. Second. Any discussion? All right, roll call vote, please. Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes, yes. Diane Salter, yes. Kimberly Smith Kalaga, yes. Hillary Stokowski, yes. Jeff Zoki, yes. Lisa Cavaluno, yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Okay, our next item is the approval of the BHS Spanish class overnight trip. Move, so, go ahead. Move that the Brandon Board of Education approve the high school Spanish class overnight trip to Chicago, March 10th through the 11th, 2022, as presented. Support. All right, and for part of our discussion, we <laughs> have <laughs> a guest speaker. So exciting. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lori Marino. I'm one of the Spanish teachers at the high school. Uh, thank you for letting me come tonight. Uh, we have been, um, we were sad last year. We had a Puerto Rico trip planned for um, June of 2020 and it was canceled due to COVID and we opted not to reschedule because we weren't sure how long COVID would last and um, we didn't want our families having so much money tied up in a company. So we put that on the back burner. I got um, groups of students now who were signed up for this Puerto Rico trip and they were just, they're just so motivated and excited and they love learning, they love culture. And I wanted to offer them something, but an overseas trip at this point just didn't seem feasible until we get a better handle on COVID. So I did some research and in Chicago, there seems to be quite a few things um, that would fit what we're doing in class and just support our cultural studies. I don't know, did you all get a itinerary in here? So you probably have to see. So there's some dining, some dancing, some art museums. Um, Pilsen Village, I never even heard of before that book, House on Mango Street, if you're familiar with that, um, some of the younger grades will read excerpts from it. I know Mr. Martin in his AP English class, that's an option. And I've even looked at possibly um, seeing if we could do that book in Spanish for as well. Mm -hmm. But um, they have murals where they'll go through and talk you through them. There's a, a little Mexican art museum and village. So it just would provide kids with two days. It would be one night um, with just something to look forward to. I picked March because it's after the holidays and snow days and before all the <laughs> crazy testing and seniors leave. So it seemed like a good time. And we do a project in my Spanish 4 class. Um, they, they research and present on artists from the Spanish speaking world. So this would fall after they've done their research. So I thought it would be more meaningful then. I'm presenting to you now instead of in the fall because I am cognizant that for some families they want students to be able to participate, but it is, it's about a $500 trip. And this would allow families to enroll and have um, monthly payments of about $60 a month. So that would be more doable than hitting them in September with, with a larger sum. I talked with Jan a little bit too. Um, one of the things we're obviously looking at would be security with making this kind of an investment. If you know COVID got worse, if for some reason the district didn't feel it was safe for students to go. So um, there is a $36 protection fee that we're rolling into the cost that everybody will just pay. If for any reason, the district, the board, um, the Spanish teachers, mm -hmm. individual parents, anybody feels that this is, you know, something that isn't safe or whatnot, the absolute most, anybody's going to lose is $36. That's like the day before. I mean, they can write up until we leave. So, yeah, so I felt like, I mean, we, you got your money, you got two girls, but you got, you got your money back, but it was like 10 weeks of me just, um, and they learned a lot too, these travel companies have learned a lot too, that they obviously want to keep their businesses going and be reputable. And World Strides is the provider for this trip, and they do the DC trip and Puerto Rico trip and the choir trip, so they've, they've really been a good provider for us. So that's what I'm asking, I'm asking for approval to be able to offer this trip. Just 
students. It would be students in Spanish, three, four, and five initially, and then I just need to kind of gauge the numbers. And um, depending on if we need to fill a bus, we could open it up to Spanish twos, or maybe we have so many three, fours, and fives that we have a second bus, and then we could take, you know, fill that bus and take two groups of students. Great idea. Do you have any questions for me? Sure. I'm excited to see it. <laughs> I'm excited to see a trip. Yeah. Right. Thank you for finding a solution, you know, yeah. an opportunity for them yeah. and being so considerate about it and, and really just doing something that's doable and, you know, just thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's good. Really appreciate the information you're coming in to share with us about it and appreciate all your efforts every year because I know, I know you were you were sweating it last spring. It was tough. It was tough. I know. And so, thank you for caring so much. I appreciate it. Does anybody have any other question or comment on this topic? All right. It looks like we're ready for a, a roll call vote, please. Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes, yes. Diane Salter, yes. Kimberly Smith Colago, yes. Hilary Stakowski, yes. Jeff Zilke, yes. Lisa Cavaluna, yes. Motion passes. Our next item is the school bond loan fund. Let me start over. School bond <laughs> loan fund refunding resolution. Moved that the Brandon Board of Education approved the school bond loan fund refunding resolution as presented. Support. Any discussion on this item? No. All right. Roll call. Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes, yes. Diane Salter? Yes. Kimberly Smith Kalaga? Yes. Hilary Stokowski? Yes. Jeff Zoki? Yes. Lisa Cavahuna? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Next, our line item is approval of Kids Read Now. Move the Brandon Board of Education approve Kids Read Now as presented. Support. Any discussion? <laughs> No? Okay. Roll call vote, please. Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes? Yes. Diane Salter? Yes. Kimberly Smith Kalaga? Yes. Hilary Stukowski? Yes. Jeff Zoki? Yes. Lisa Cavahuna? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, our next line item is approval of request for a proposal for Harvey Swanson septic field. Move that the Brandon Board of Education approve the issuing of a request for a proposal for a new septic field at Harvey's Pond. This field will replace the existing field number three as presented. So far. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Anybody have any questions on this line item? Or and this was mostly discussed last month, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. the additional last field. Okay, so it's the adding of the other one. Yes, it's the okay. adding of the, and yeah, it's the one by the ball diamond. Okay. And, and we are waiting for approval from the um, county. So once we get that, we'll issue the RFP. We're hoping it's sooner rather than later. So Mark's been talking to them. And so we may not issue this immediately. Yes. All right. Very good. Um, without further discussion, uh, may I have a roll call? Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes, yes. Diane Salter, yes. Kimberly Smith Kalaga, yes. Hilary Stokowski, yes. Jeff Zoki, yes. Ms. Cavahuna, yes. Our next line item is our Oakland County Road Commission lawsuit resolution of claims. Move the Brandon Board of Education approve settlement of Oakland County Road Commission lawsuit as presented. I have support. Support. Any discussion? It has to do with the roundabout area, right? Yep. It has to do with the a roundabout um, whereby many years ago, uh, apparently, the district did own a piece of property in uh, the county's efforts to acquire all the bits of pieces of property it takes to create um, this traffic pattern. They um, brought a complaint basically, you know, to quiet title in essence, make sure everybody who has a say in any of those pieces is good. 
good to go. Mm -hmm. And with that, we, even though it's been some time, the school district's name came up in the title search, along with many others, I'm sure, and therefore was brought into this suit. I mean, we're not being sued for anything as much as we're just trying to have our word be heard, express our interest in this property if we actually had one. We're assured by our council after um, also conducting, you know, analyzing the title that we do not have an interest. So by moving forward, Signing this um, consent, uh, we are removing ourselves from the case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, go we'll call vote. Melissa Clark, yes. Rebecca Haynes, yes. Diane Salter, yes. Kimberly Smith Kalaga, yes. Hillary Stokowski, yes. Jeff Silky, yes. Lisa Cavalino, yes. All right, motion passes. Okay, now um, move on to citizens' input. I'm good. You're good? All right. Yes, please. Thank you. We do not have any. Comments? Thank you. All right. And with that, we are adjourned. That's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.